Okay, so thank you, Neil, and thank everybody for uh, joining today. I'm just going to try and share my screen, um, and then we'll be able to start to show you uh, what I've prepared. So, there we are. Um, so I'm Patrick Kiley, I'm a consultant rheumatologist and I work at St George's Hospital in South West London. I'll talk for about 40 minutes, chromatosis can get, a little bit about management and treatment, and then we'll have lots of time up to the full hour um, to answer any questions. And please feel free to ask questions, it doesn't matter how simple they are, I'm happy um, to, to really cover as much as I can for you. So um, as you all know, uh, this is a genetic condition. Um, if you have hemochromatosis, if you have hemochromatosis, then that implies that you have a mutation in a gene. And the gene that's responsible for hemochromatosis in the vast majority of people is located on chromosome 6. And it's been called the HFE gene. H stands for high and FE is ferrous, so high iron gene. And what genes do is that they make proteins or they code for proteins. So the HFE gene has a protein, which is the HFE protein. And the uh, problem is that if you have a mutation in the genetic code on the chromosome, then the resulting protein that is made isn't right, it's different. And the vast majority of people in, of North European ancestry who have genetic hemochromatosis with iron overload are in that position because of two mutations, one from mum, one from dad, at position 282, leading to the protein not being expressed on cell surfaces. And if you haven't got the protein available on the cell surface, it can't do its job. And the consequence of not having an HFE protein expressed on your cell surface is that you are deficient in this secondary thing called hepcidin. And hepcidin absence means that we just absorb far too much iron from our diet. And that then is a sequence of events. Genetic mutation, uh, the consequential protein is changed, and that then leads to hepcidin deficiency, which then leads to too much iron being absorbed. And then a, a set of pathologies as a consequence of too much iron. There are also what we call minor mutations, also in the HFE gene on chromosome 6. But the consequence of this is slightly different alterations of the HFE protein. And these mutations generally take place at position 63. And that then has different consequences, which we don't completely understand. But as a generalization, they are not as intense or severe. So um, if we look at the how common it is to have these mutations, at the very bottom of that blue box are those people who have c 2 i mutation from mum and from dad. So we call that a double copy or homozygous. And then that is about 1 in 250 to, two, to 1 in 300 of the North European population. And all of those people with that double genotype do not necessarily get iron overload. And in fact, the proportion that get iron overload is rather low. I would say 10% here, it may be slightly higher. It's higher in men than women, and it's higher the older you get. But the point is that the vast majority, or over half, probably don't get iron overload throughout their whole life. If you have the minor mutation H63D, or just one copy of the major mutation C282 with the wild type, then the prevalence is much more common in our society, in our North European population, but the consequence of having too much iron is much rarer. Um, so that's a kind of genetic background, and you're probably all aware of that. So I'll move swiftly on to uh, the arthritis, which I know more about than the genes. So I became a consultant at St George's in 1999, and it took me about 10 years to see my first case of hemochromatosis arthritis. And then I saw a second case um, rather quickly um, about three or four months later. They were slightly different, like these two buses, London buses, slightly different, uh, but they were the same disease. They both came along together within about, at about the same time, 11 years into my consultant journey. And I thought it was a very interesting condition. There wasn't very much known about the condition. And that then led me to become interested and to do more uh, for people with this condition. And with the help of the Hemochromatosis Society, um, I set up a national clinic. Here at St George's is a nice picture of our Hotung Centre at St George's in the sunshine, a day like today. Uh, we started this now 11 years ago, um, seeing patients locally from my patch in southwest London, but also with the clinic being promoted by the society, for which I'm very grateful, 
and patients uh, were able to persuade their GPs to, to refer them to me from other places in the country. And I've been able to see patients from uh, more distant locations. So for me at this stage in 2012, I, I knew a little bit, but not really very much. And so I just set about a very standardized process of assessing people by taking down their story with great interest in detail, examining the joints, doing x-rays, MRI scans, and as we would say in modern speak, trying to get my head around uh, the sort of arthritis that people with hemochromatosis were getting. I guess if you look at the key features of this arthritis, uh, the mean age of onset is in the mid 50s. Uh, patients will often say that there's been a frustrating delay between their symptoms of hemochromatosis, whether it's joint pain or fatigue, and someone actually twigging or, or realizing or, or thinking, could it be hemochromatosis? And then the diagnostic tests being done. And when we asked patients, what were your most common symptoms when you were first diagnosed with hemochromatosis? And you'll see at the bottom of this box, fatigue and joint pain stand out, head and shoulders as being more common than all the other blizzard, blizzard of, of array of other potential symptoms that people report. So for me as a rheumatologist, I was interested in which joints were affected. And really what I was hearing was that the hips and the knees uh, were often affected. And that's a very typical joint for osteoarthritis. But there were some joints being affected, such as the MCP knuckle joints. I'll show you these in a moment. And the ankle joints, which are not so commonly, if ever, affected in primary osteoarthritis. And so there were already patterns sticking out for me uh, way back in the early days that made the arthritis look different from what you might call common or garden osteoarthritis. And in fact, if we asked patients, and um, I examined patients and looked to see which joints were involved, the ones in red, the knee, the ankle, and two of the knuckle joints, the MCP and the PIP knuckle joints, so I'll show you in a minute which ones those are, they stand out as the most frequently involved joints. So as a rheumatologist, when we say what sort of arthritis is it, we'd say, well, basically, superficially, it looks like osteoarthritis. So an osteoarthritic joint, when you look at it and feel it, it's, it's larger than it should be, and, the, and it's larger because it's swollen from bone, extra bone formation. And the joint moves rather stiffly and not as well as it should. It's painful to move. And when you look at the cartilage on an X-ray or the MRI, there's not as much cartilage as you would normally expect in a healthy joint. And the bone either side of the cartilage is sclerotic or thickened, and there may well be cysts in the bone either side of the cartilage. Now, the MCP joints, so you see I've shown MCP joint with a little box and an arrow there, that first line of, of knuckles where the fingers join the hand, they are very classically affected in hemochromatosis, and often it's the index finger and the middle finger, so what we call MCP2 and 3, which are affected. And if they're stiff, when you try and make a fist, because they're stiff, those joints don't bend as well, and that means that the fingers of the clenched fist of the second and third fingers of the hand sort of stick up prominently over and above the fourth and fifth fingers. And that little cartoon on the left is what we call the iron fist, or, or the type of deformed fist formation of the fingers in people where those second and third metacarpophalangeal joints aren't bending properly. And that's what we call the iron fist. So looking at x-rays, um, what we see in regular osteoarthritis is this concept of new bone formation. But in hemochromatosis arthritis, the size of the osteophytes is larger or more exuberant than you often see in regular osteoarthritis. So the arrows there, which I put onto this x-ray, you can see as little what we call hooks of new bone growth around the edge of the, in this case, the middle finger MCP joints of both these two hands. And that's a very characteristic feature, which we don't see in regular osteoarthritis, but we do see in hemochromatosis arthritis. So involvement of these metacarpophalangeal joints and such exuberant new bone growth or osteophyte growth that it looks like a hook. And then here are all the joints now labeled out for you. So first CMC is the bottom of the, of the thumb and that's very commonly affected in osteoarthritis. MCP are these two joints, second and third in particular, uh, which are affected by um, hemochromatosis then the proximal interphalangeal joint, PIP, and the distal interphalangeal joint, the very end knuckle of the fingers. So if you look at the, at the right X-ray on your screen, where it says MCP, and you look across at the second index finger, the middle finger, you see a very large hook osteophyte, um, just, I'm not sure there, my pointer, just there, very exuberant hook osteophyte there, also a small one there on the fourth finger and a tiny one on the second finger. So that's very classic of hemochromatosis, but we're also seeing 
um, osteoarthritic changes in the first CMC joint, which is not right, it's got loss of joint space, in the proximal interphalangeal joints, again, loss of joint space, and in the distal interphalangeal joints. So the concept of hemochromatosis in the hands is not just that the MCP joints are affected. And again, you see here another picture uh, with this 3D image of, from a CT scan showing all this extra new bone formation at the MCP joints, but also at the base of the thumb, also in the proximal interphalangeal joints, and also in the distal interphalangeal joints. So the whole hand is affected. MCP joints stand out for hemochromatosis, but the other joints are also affected. And in fact, when we ask patients to say which bits of their hands were affected, you see here, base of thumb, wrist, PIP, MCP, TIP, they're all being recorded as being stiff and sore and knobbly and affected. So an exuberant osteoarthritic condition, uh, characteristically involving the MCP joints, but also involving the PIP joints, the DIP joints, at the base of the thumb and the wrist. So all joints potentially affected in the hands. Then we go back then to the, the, the list of the top four joints which people say are painful or stiff when they have hemochromatosis. And as a rheumatologist, what always stands out for us is typical and atypical. And it's not typical or common to see the ankle as an osteoarthritic joint. And yet the ankle was often Often mentioned by patients as being a joint which hurts and when examined didn't move as well and when x-rayed was osteoarthritic. So just to, to explain this point, when we think about osteoarthritis, mostly we talk about primary osteoarthritis, which means the person has developed osteoarthritis of their hip or their knee out of the blue, if you like. They're going along doing a normal life. There's no particular exacerbating factors. And yet the hip or the knee becomes stiff and sore and they have osteoarthritis. So they just get it out of the blue. Another reason to get osteoarthritis is because you've had trauma to the joint. You've maybe broken the bone or you've had some sort of injury, um, rugby, football, contact sport, that sort of thing. Or you have a different arthritis already, which affects that joint, such as gout or rheumatoid arthritis. So for the hip and the knee, when you see people presenting with osteoarthritis, by and large, it's much more commonly primary. So in this series, of patients, 65% of those presenting with hip osteoarthritis were primary and of knee, 82% were primary. And only 8% or 12% was the hip or the knee osteoarthritis due to trauma. But then you look to the right at the ankle. When people come forward to the orthopedic department with ankle osteoarthritis, it's the other way around. It's not so commonly primary in this series, 19%, whereas 54% were after trauma. So if the ankle is caught up in osteoarthritis, there's usually a traumatic explanation or another arthritis in the ankle, such as gout or rheumatoid, which has made it osteoarthritic. And much less common for the ankle to become osteoarthritic out of the blue, in other words, primary. And in this series that I've shown you, there's only 48 cases of ankle osteoarthritis here. And so the authors waited a bit longer, so they got a lot more cases, now 639 cases. It took them 13 years to get these cases. And again, the same pattern is there. Only 7% was the arthritis primary out of the blue, whereas in nearly 70%, 69 to be precise, was it following some sort of trauma to the ankle joint. Now, in hemochromatosis, when people come forward with foot pain, it is the ankle that they say is sore, and there's no preceding trauma. So it's come out of the blue. So for a rheumatologist to see primary osteoarthritis of the ankle is weird, it's unusual, it's rare. And that would make you think potentially of another disease such as hemochromatosis. So we looked in detail at the ankles and what we saw, as you see with this little black arrow, was some cysts um, just beside the joint line. Now we do see cysts in regular osteoarthritis, but they seem to be very prominent in the hemochromatosis cases. And then when we did MRI scans, they really were prominent. You see here, I put white arrows to help you see, but there's these white um, circular structures, which are cysts either side of the joint line. So very prominent. And here's another image of a different person. Again, a whole bunches of grapes almost, um, either side of the joint line, very prominent cysts. And I wondered to myself, is this what you'd expect to see with regular osteoarthritis of the ankle? Or are we seeing more cysts in the hemochromatosis people than in those people who've just got regular osteoarthritis? And in fact, when we looked left to right and centre at the hips and other joints, we were seeing cysts there as well. 
up. So we did a study where we compared the MRI features of ankles in people with hemochromatosis and ankle arthritis and people with just primary non-hemochromatosis ankle osteoarthritis. And indeed, we did find that people with hemochromatosis who had ankle osteoarthritis had much higher scores for cysts and much more extensive cartilage loss and much larger osteophytes than we would see in people with regular pulmonary garden primary osteoarthritis. So it's almost as if the hemochromatosis gene is driving an osteoarthritis process, which is accelerated and exuberant and if you like over the top. So more cysts than normal, much more rapid loss of cartilage than normally seen and large osteophytes than normally seen in regular osteoarthritis. So large these osteophytes that we call them hooks in the hands. Now, a lot of what we do in clinical medicine is we recognize patterns because thank goodness diseases have their own disease uh, characteristics and that manifests in patterns. And when somebody has a certain type of chest pain, we say that sounds like esophagitis or that sounds like a heart attack. When somebody has a certain distribution of joints affected, we say that looks like an osteoarthritic pattern or a rheumatoid pattern or a gout pattern. And so is the case with hemochromatosis, that if you recognize the pattern of joint involvement in most people and you learn that, then hopefully you're going to start picking it up earlier in undiagnosed cases. And here my rusty nails is a bit of a sort of... Um, um, artistics license. So what I would say to a trainee and rheumatologist or to a general practitioner or to an acute physician who's seeing people coming up to a and &E with bad ankles and hands and joints is if someone appears at face value to have osteoarthritis but they got it at an early age of onset by which I mean less than 60 years of age and there was no trauma, rugby injury, dislocated shoulder in the gym, et cetera, et cetera, to explain the fact they've got osteoarthritis. And the osteoarthritis is in rather odd joints, such as the metacarpophalangeal joints of the hand or the ankle. Then you should be thinking alarm bells. This isn't regular osteoarthritis. You're too young. There's no trauma. These are weird joints to get osteoarthritis. And you go and do some x-rays. and You see florid cysts and lots of osteophytes and lots of cartilage loss then you should think, is this the pattern of hemochromatosis arthropathy? Because it is. That is the pattern of hemochromatosis arthropathy. And when we consider that patients often feel frustrated at how long it took somebody to work out they had hemochromatosis, if we could embed this pattern recognition in the GP's mind or the general physician's mind and even the rheumatologist's mind, then perhaps some people who are not yet diagnosed would have this sort of arthritis might actually be diagnosed a bit quicker. Now we'll talk a bit about treatment. So people have hemochromatosis, they have arthritis affecting some of their joints, and what can we do to treat? So the word treatment usually embodies the idea of make it better. So the first very frustrating thing is that we know of no interventions which will stop the arthritis developing if it's going to develop with your genetic mu mutation. And if it has developed, we know of no treatments that will stop it from progressing and getting worse for the vast majority of people. And that includes arthritis with any of the genetic mutations, the c 2 h homozygous, which is a commonest type that leads to iron overload, but also the arthritis seen in the less common in the less in the mutations which less commonly cause iron overload. So the compound heterozygotes, the heterozygotes c 2 h 2 ys the H632 heterozygotes, or even the homozygous H63, H63Ds. So irrespective of your genetic mutation, if you've got arthritis, there is no medication which will stop it happening in the first place or stop it progressing. If you were picked up early rather than late, I'm afraid, again, it's miserable news. There's no medication that can get in there early and stop it from developing or progressing. And of course, fenisection is really, really important to get ferritin down to less than 50, transferrin saturation down to less than 50% as I think the agreed target of today. And in those that get there, that's very important for their livers, for fatigue, for their heart and so forth. But in general terms, it doesn't help progression of arthritis. And in terms of pharmacology and treatments, again, no known medication to disease modifier to stop the disease in its tracks. But that's OK, that, that's depressing and that's really miserable. But can a doctor help you? And the answer is we can still. So first of all, 
if you like, you might want to fight it or you might want to do your best to preserve your joints. And keeping moving is incredibly important. And there's a very nice little leaflet here um, from Versus Arthritis and the web link is on the bottom left. You just go into Versus Arthritis, keep moving. And it's a lovely little booklet uh, which gives good advice about exercise. And the take home point is that low impact, mid range exercises are the ones we would recommend. The thing, things where there's no weight bearing or resistance. So swimming, cycling, the cross trainer. Pilates is a great discipline. Tai Chi is very good for balance. And you move the joint through the middle of its range without taking it to the extreme of its range, which is what yoga would do. And whilst many people love yoga and yoga is great for stiff people, if you have an arthritic joint and you try and stretch it beyond its range, you might not do yourself any good. It may actually harm the joint capsule by stretching it when it, when it can't. Walking and running are very good exercises for many people. There are some very enthusiastic runners out there, including myself, I have to admit, and many people don't want to be told not to run. And if you are going to run, then it should be with very good cushion trainers and on a soft surface such as trail running or on grass rather than on the pavement or on the road. So definitely keep moving, but low impact, mid-range exercises. Swimming is utterly the best, uh, but cycling the cross trainer Pilates and Tai Chi are all to be recommended. Now, with the ankle in mind, and I've stressed the ankle a lot, uh, but also knees and hips, uh, the biomechanics of how we walk and how weight is borne through our legs is very, very important. And if you're into engineering and physics, you'll totally understand. So we are designed to walk with straight legs and our feet straight. So the neutral position in the middle of the picture at the bottom is how we're supposed to be walking. But if your foot happens to tilt either inwards or outwards, so uh, that's what's called pronation outwards and supination inwards, then that alters the biomechanics and the weight bearing forces, not just through the ankle where that tilt is, but also up through the whole leg. And you can get people who've got non-specific pains in their knees, their hips, or even their back because their feet are not walking in a neutral position. So it's really important to get someone to look at the way you walk. And if you're not walking in a neutral position, and it's very common not to walk in a neutral position, lots of people are pronated, some are supinated, then putting in an orthotic makes such a huge difference. It's really, really good thing to do. It's not a toxic medication. It costs in the region of, I suppose, 100 to 200 pounds, depending on where you go, how you get it. But that is a, such an important investment in pain relief and protection of your weight bearing joints against future damage. Because if you neutralize the abnormal gait, then the weight bearing that should be there and the biomechanics are restored. And hopefully that will reduce the progression of abnormal biomechanical loading and damage as a consequence. If you do go down the orthotic route, which I strongly advise you to if they are indicated, be fussy about your orthotic. If the first set you get made for you don't seem right, go back. Often they have to be trimmed and altered because they're all bespoke for the individual person and their foot. And if you've had orthotics for a few years and they don't seem quite as good, they wear out and you may need to get fresh ones uh, repeatedly. OK, now down to medication and, and medication is there for all of us. And some people love it. Some people want to avoid it. But basically, this is the way I think about medication for pain relief. Knowing that venesection does not work for most people, we have three types of painkillers available to prescribe. Uh, first of all, is the so-called compound analgesic family. The weakest is paracetamol, which you can buy over the counter. There are then paracetamol and codeine compound preparations, such as cocodamol. Then there are stronger opioids, which I think, in my view, are best given uh, as a transdermal preparation. So you put a patch on your skin and there's one called Butrans or buprenorphine patch, which can be changed every seven days. But there's a lot of concern about overprescription of opioids, oxycodone and morphine and so on. And that's because they are addictive. And it's probably not a great idea to get to or, or, or to go down the very, very strong opioid route if you're going to have chronic pain for many years. And so tramadol would come into that list as well. So we do worry about giving people very strong opioids, but regular paracetamol taken not just when you're in agony, but taken with breakfast and with lunch and with afternoon tea, or cocodamol the same, can do a lot of good. 
you can get constipation and you making these painkillers regularly is better in general than taking them only when you reach a point of great discomfort. Uh, and then the transdermal preparations would come as the next layer of intervention if the codeine and paracetamol are not good enough. Then there's the non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, of which there are two subgroups, the non-selective ones such as ibuprofen, naproxen and, and diclofenac, and then the selective ones which cause less gastric upset, of which etorocoxib and celecoxib are the two most commonly used. Now, these can be very, very helpful. There are some people who can't take non steroidal drugs if they're on blood thinners or they've got a strong history of gastric or duodenal ulcers. But for those that, that don't fall in that category, then taking anti-inflammatories at night to reduce morning stiffness or during the day for daytime stiffness can be very effective. And we sometimes give an omeprazole or lansoprazole, the proton pump inhibitors that prevent um, acid release uh, to make them more, more easy to tolerate. And of course, the secondary gain for hemochromatosis patients of taking omeprazole or lansoprazole is that it also prevents iron absorption and might reduce your um, frequency or, or regularity of, of need to have venesection. And then the final family of these three families of painkillers is what's called the neuropathic agents. Now, this is a little bit more complicated to understand, uh, but the point is that if you're in pain for months and months and months, then the way the brain, the way the ba the brain processes pain becomes what we call sensitized and that means that the threshold at which we perceive a stimulus to be painful becomes lower and that means for example if you just pinch yourself then if you don't have pain sensitization your brain says oh something's pinching my hand that, that's just a pinch and you don't really mind but if your pain sensitized then that very same pressure which is a pinch to me is actually felt as a sharp pain to the pain sensitized individual. And that's because chronic pain reduces the threshold whereby the brain decides something is painful rather than just an annoying bit of pressure. And drugs such as amitriptyline and pregabalin are very good at helping pain sensitization. They have the potential for drowsiness and not everybody gets on with them, but amitriptyline taken at night once a day and pregabalin taken twice a day can be very good as an adjunctive pain relief for those that have pain sensitization. Pregabalin is usually prescribed for epilepsy, but we give it for pain sensitization in a much lower dose. Um, secondly, um, we can sometimes do joint injections. Um, this is a very useful thing for short term pain relief. So, for example, if the joint isn't responding to paracetamol, codeine, anti-inflammatories, but is, in, is still swollen and still sore, then putting a steroid injection into the joint can give very effective pain relief for three or four months at best, or maybe just six to ten weeks if, if it's less good or even less if it's disappointing. Um, we can do knees in the clinic. We can do the individual MCP and PIP joints in the clinic. And this is a tiny little insulin needle that I use to do the knuckle joints. And it looks a bit gruesome, but I use a cold spray. And although it is a needle going into the joint, um, it's usually tolerated reasonably well. And the pain relief can be really very, very substantial. A hip could also be injected, but we would normally inject a hip um, by ultrasound control um, in a radiology department. And we can also inject ankles but again, because they're quite difficult to get a needle into the ankle joint, we'll usually do that under ultrasound control. So joint injections um, are a great adjunct for temporary periods of pain relief at best three to four months, usually in the two months sort of ballpark. OK, and then finally, if all else fails, then we do rely heavily on our orthopaedic surgical colleagues who can be very helpful, either by fusing a joint, you see here an ankle on the right has been fused, or by replacing the joint. Both of these interventions mean that you have less pain and hopefully no pain. The reason why a joint hurts is that when it's moved, but arthritic, that movement causes pain. So if you fuse the joint rigid, then it can't move. And so it doesn't, doesn't hurt. And for the ankle, that's great if it doesn't hurt. But of course, there is a downside because you can't actually rock your foot against your leg. And so the foot is completely rigid. But when you do walk on this rigid foot, um, at the ankle, um, it doesn't hurt. Joint replacement surgery for the hips and the knees is very well established. 
generally very successful. There are exceptions. Some people don't get on so well, but mostly the outcomes are very good and the pain relief is substantial and people often don't look back. OK, so there are some conundrums um, in my mind about the arthritis that we see in people with hemochromatosis. So the basic mantra is that you have the genetic mutation chromosome 6 that leads to the HFE protein being abnormal, that then leads to hepcidin deficiency, and that leads to iron overload. And it's absolutely clear that too much iron is bad for us. It's bad for our livers, bad for our hearts, it makes us feel fatigued, and it's almost certainly bad for your joints. But there's things about the arthritis and hemochromatosis which don't necessarily mean to me that the iron is the only answer. Because if you get rid of the iron through venisection, it doesn't really help the joints. If you have a patient with hemochromatosis who's already been venisected for the last five years, they've been at maintenance, suddenly a new joint joins in and they've now got arthritis in an ankle or in a hip or a knee, which wasn't there before. And that didn't occur in the presence of too much iron. And we also see classic cases of, of hemochromatosis arthritis, the pattern recognition I've talked about in people with the mutation who never ever got iron overloaded in the first place. And those three observations would make me feel that maybe there's something about this gene which does something not very nice to the joints, independent of whether or not you are also iron overloaded. So just to show that, uh, this is asking people um, who had joint pains with hemochromatosis, the underwent phlebotomy, did the phlebotomy make your joint pains any better? Answer is only in 13%, whereas in 86% it was the joints were no better or worse. And in my own series, you see here, only 5% of patients I asked, 249 people, did venisection help your joints? Only 5% said they thought it did. 20% the joints stayed the same. 24% the same joints became worse. And 51 new joints became affected. That's despite reaching maintenance venisection being de-ironed. And then we see patients like this. Here's a 67-year-old man who's got the classic C2H2I homozygous double um, mutation, but the transferrin saturation is 25% and the ferritin is 260. And the bottom left, you see the, the uh, criteria for being iron loaded. Uh, for a man, the ferritin is over 300, so he's not over 300, and transferrin saturation over 45%, and he's not over 45%. Yet, if you look at the joints, look at the ankle, it's been fused already because it's so arthritic. You see there's new bone here in the elbow, a new bone there at the back of the elbow. And in the fingers, there's definitely MCP arthritis. So there's no joint space in the MCP joints. There's exuberant PIP, um, new bone formation. So I would say looking at that person's x-rays, that looks like hemochromatosis arthritis. And yes, they have the hemochromatosis mutation, but they were never iron overloaded. So it can't all be about the iron, surely. Here's another one. Here's an 80-year-old lady, so she's also not iron overloaded. And look at her right middle finger MCP joint. That is a hook osteophyte, and there's no joint space there either. So again, I would say that's the pattern of hemochromatosis arthritis, and she's got a very minor mutation. Her mutation is one copy of H63D from mum or dad, and the other copy of that uh, chromosome 6 HFE gene is completely normal. So only one copy of H63D not iron overloaded, yet she has MCP disease in that right third finger with a hook osteophyte. And here's a young man, 22 years old, no trauma, no fracture. He has no high impact sports in his whole life. And he has one copy of C282Y from mum or dad and the normal gene of chromosome 6 from the other parent. And he's not iron overloaded either. And these are CT images showing these huge cysts that are formed here. And again, you see the MRI with these cysts here which looks very much like hemochromatosis arthropathy, and he has one copy of the gene, not two, and was never iron overloaded. So in rheumatology, the world of hemochromatosis does have some enthusiasts. I'm not the only enthusiast, and here's a group of faces of European rheumatologists, and we first met um, some years ago in London in, uh, and put together ourselves a little group, which we call the Hemochromatosis Arthritis Research Initiative, uh, to look at patients with this condition and look at their arthritis and to try and make more sense of it. And uh, one of the most important organisations is called the European League Against Rheumatism. Um, and we have formed a study group under their auspices, uh, identifying some key unmet needs, including classification criteria, early detection, understanding how you get the arthritis from the gene mutation, trying to develop better therapies and better pain management. 
And having a study group is quite an important thing because it attracts other people to join because they also think it's interesting and gives a structure uh, to form a framework to hopefully lead to future research. But any research in the future, you have to have the bedrock, which is classification criteria for the arthritis. You have to be able to say who's got this arthritis to enroll them into a study and therefore look at the outcome of various new uh, uh, drugs on the condition. So the most important thing we've set about doing is creating standardised classification criteria for people with this arthritis. And that kicked off in early 2020, uh, has been grossly delayed by the COVID pandemic, unfortunately. But we are at the point now where, thanks to many patients, and maybe some of you are listening today, thank you very much for coming forward and letting us look at your joints, take down details, your patterns of joint involvement comparing that with people with osteoarthritis. And I'm hoping that in the second part of this year, we'll move on to the data analysis stage and start to develop classification criteria. And then we can say, if you have these criteria, we can enroll you in this study of hemochromatosis arthritis, looking at a new drug to see if that is effective for your condition. So if we get there, that'll be a huge step forward. And I hope to be able to deliver that in the middle of next year. So that's probably all the time I'm going to speak. I've done about um, 40 minutes, as I said. Um, thank you um, to Hemochromatosis UK who have supported uh, the setting up of our clinic and have been very supportive to me in my efforts to help patients. And EFAP is the umbrella organisation in Europe of all the patient societies uh, for patients or people with hemochromatosis in all the EU member states. So I'll top, stop talking there. I hope you've managed to hear me. I'm sorry I was interrupted part way through, but I've got over that. I look forward to, um, to answering your questions. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. And uh, I think many people on this call are also uh, hemochromatosis enthusiasts. So you're, you're amongst friends. Um, we've had a few questions already come in on the Q&A. Um, if anybody has a burning question and you haven't quite got round to tapping it in, uh, on the Zoom bar, which is usually at the bottom of your screen, but maybe on the left-hand side, there's a Q&A button. Uh, do feel free to uh, ask your questions in there. What, what we're going to do now is in the remaining time available, which is about 20 minutes, uh, we'll rattle through as many questions as we can. Um, hopefully we'll get through all of them. So I'm going to start um, with the first question, if I may, which is from Karen. And Karen asks a, quite a, a broad question about clinical education. Karen wants to know how do orthopaedic specialists learn about hemochromatosis and when do they learn about it? Okay, so for, for all of the different ologies, um, when someone leaves medical school and does their foundation year work, they then decide what sort of doctor they want to be. So, an orth so somebody will join an orthopaedic training program. And in that program, they'll learn the nuts and bolts of how to do the operations, and they'll also learn about the diseases which they operate on. And so therefore, it depends on what diseases are put into the curriculum. And the curriculum is full of the commonest diseases, because common happens commonly, and that's what you work on. So if it's a rare disease, like hemochromatosis, it will often not get much prominence in the curriculum. So then you hope that the trainee working alongside their consultant colleague will have the unusual cases pointed out to them on the shop floor like any other apprenticeship. The trainees will also go to training programmes where they'll listen to lectures all day and there'll be orthopaedic society meetings. So they'll go to the orthopaedic society meeting, there'll be lectures presented where someone like me might stand up and say, this is to give you the heads up about this rare type of arthritis or this rare type of bone disease. And therefore, in some ways, the squeaky wheel gets the oil and the enthusiasts of the rare diseases get to push forward and talk about their particular rare bone disease or, or, or disease. And the more quieter, shyer ones maybe don't get onto the agenda. So if hemochromatosis arthritis is going to get into the mindset of the orthopaedic surgeon, the GP, the rheumatologist, then you really want to see it on the agenda of the meetings. Uh, and with that in mind, actually, I've I have been invited to talk at the Primary Care Rheumatology Society meeting this coming autumn in Harrogate, uh, because they happened to hear me talk at the British Society for Rheumatology meeting just this year in April, and they liked the talk, and they thought we could do with hearing this again, and so I'll be going to York. And that's how things happen. You, you know, things, you know, it's like a domino effect. You hear one good talk, and you want to hear it somewhere else, then you hear that, then you want to hear it again. And that's the squeaky wheel, getting the oil. Fantastic. And, and I was at the, the BSR conference earlier this year, 
and uh, and heard Patrick delivering his presentation. And actually, it was standing room only for one of the presentations. So I can attest to how uh, well received his uh, presentations are. Um, I want to turn now to uh, a question from Martin. Uh, Martin says, my children are carriers. Might they develop hemochromatosis arthropathy without iron overload? So the answer is maybe. And Martin, I'm afraid there's nothing you can do about it, really, other than just to be aware that they carry a gene which in some unfortunate people does lead to what looks like osteoarthritis at a relatively early age. Um, but I'm afraid it's really, you know, it's a rather miserable response I'm giving you because if it happens, it happens. Um, and then you would treat it as you would treat osteoarthritis because we've got no disease modifying therapy available to get in there early to stop it happening. Um, but it's not, if you said to people, how likely is it to happen? I guess it's probably not that likely, uh, but it's a maybe. Hmm. Okay, great. Um, Julie has a question. Julie says, I'm waiting for an orthopedics appointment to discuss ankle fusion. What is your opinion of this procedure versus ankle replacement for an otherwise fit and well person? So it depends a bit, Julie, on how old you are um, and which hospital you're going to. So whereas hip and knee orthopedic surgeons are very common on the ground, good hind foot ankle surgeons are rarer to come across. And whereas any orthopedic surgeon can fuse a joint, which will give you good pain relief, but will leave your foot and ankle unit rigid, which won't be so functionally good, it's only in the specialist centers that an ankle will be replaced. So if you wanted a holistic view of the best orthopedic things to do for your ankle, you might just check that the hospital you're being referred to has got foot and ankle surgeons who do ankle joint replacements and how many they do and are they an experienced unit? Because they will be the ones that say, okay, for your ankle, yes, we can replace it. The bone looks okay to replace. Or for your ankle, I'm really sorry, it's got too late. All we can do here is fuse it. But if you go to an orthopedic department, all they do is fusions and all they'll offer you is fusions. So ideally you should go, especially if you're in the younger age range, to an advanced ankle and foot unit that has the option of replacement done by experienced surgeons as well as fusion. They can then weigh up the two for you. Fantastic. So shop around a little bit, I think, is, is the sort of the short answer. Uh, Sean has a question. Sean says, I'm C282Y homozygous and my main symptoms were swollen hands, I think it is, which were mildly painful in winter. Her stored ferritin is declining through venesection. And what Sean wants to know is, will my swollen knuckles get better as the stored iron gets to maintenance? She's 40 years old. So you've got about a 5% chance of that according to our survey, about 5% of people have found that the ironing and fatty sections help the hand, help their joints uh, get better, but the vast majority did not. Thank you. Um, Edward has a question. Um, Edward asks, are there any dietary or nutritional inputs that can help with the arthropathy deterioration? Not that we know of for certain. We recommend the Mediterranean style of diet, which is good for your overall health and immune system. Uh, we've gone from five items of fruit and veg a day to suggesting 30 different items of food a week. So variety of diet is very important for your gut microbiome, the, the bacterial diversity in your gut. Um, and now the, the approved wisdom is eat lots of different foods and ideally 33 zero different foods a week to have the most varied, healthy gut microbiome. Thank you. Um, Next question is from, let me just see if I can read this correctly. Um, so this is a question from Anne. And Anne is asking, she's saying, in requiring a knee replacement, does a rheumatologist take into consideration a diagnosis of hemochromatosis in the way that he or she approaches hip and knee replacements, or does it not matter? It doesn't really matter because the, the trigger for the for doing a replacement is the lack of response of pain to available painkillers and joint injections and the state of, of deterioration of the joint itself. And the joint will end up like that irrespective of what type of arthritis or trauma ha has brought it to that position. Thank you. Um, Julie has a question, and I apologise in advance if I don't pronounce these things correctly. <laughs> um, so Julie says, I'm taking glucosamine 
chondroitin and MSM supplements, but she's noticed no improvement. What's your view on supplements, Patrick? There's, there is some data, I think, from France that glucosamine, 1500 milligrams a day, can help pain relief for osteoarthritis in knee OA. And some people, you know, think that it's helpful. Whether it's for real or placebo probably doesn't matter because if it's helping you, it's helping you. It'll do you no harm. But I think if you're going to try a supplement, you should try and be scientific about it. So you take it re religiously for three months and see what you like and then stop it. And after a couple of months, see if you're worse. And then if you are worse, start it again and see if you're better. And that's your way of working out for yourself. Is it worth the expense of this supplement on my perceived uh, burden of symptoms? So better without, worse, sorry, better with, worse without, and then better with again. A sort of related question, actually, from me, because we get asked this a lot on the helpline and actually people ring the office and ask as well. Uh, what's your view on turmeric supplements to help with joint pain? So there's no uh, controlled trial that proves they're any good. Uh, some people anecdotally think they help. Some people are disappointed. Um, so, so it's a neutral response. Do you no harm? But no definite firm evidence that it will, it will that it's got a good chance of helping. Right. Um, Pat has a question. Uh, Pat says, I have GH osteoarthritis in the hands and she's had both hips replaced 16 years ago. She's now 75 years old and has arthritis of her spine from the neck down to the base with osteophytes and bone growth throughout. And what Pat wants to know is, could this be due to the hemochromatosis? Yeah, so we're not sure, Pat, really. I mean, the spine hasn't been looked at very much and bad backs with extra bone are, are very common in, in the regular population. That There is some genetic work from the GPRD, uh, which has come from a group in Exeter, and they may be able to shed some light whether bad backs are more common in hemochromatosis patients than regular um, members of the population. Uh, but I, I'm not quite sure what's the answer to that. Uh, James is aged 48 and says he's a classic hemochromatosis arthropathy case uh, with arthropathy in his hands and ankle. He wants to know what's the likely outlook? How fast does the arthritis progress for those with hemochromatosis? So it does vary, James. And for you, for your ankle, uh, that's your most important joint there because you have to walk on your ankle. So orthotics, if they are required, are really mandatory for you. You really must go and see a podiatrist and look at your gait and get your gait neutralised to minimize adverse loading through your ankles and then whether it deteriorates or not it will depend upon how much you're on your feet how much you weigh are you overnourished overweight for your height how much strain you're putting through that joint thank you um angela's asked a, a, a similar related question angela wants to know uh, could gh be indicated in scoliosis or other spine conditions yeah, so, so like before, we don't really know about the spine. That would only be a maybe, if not definitely. Because scoliosis, again, occurs, you know, with its own prevalence in society. And you can get that for non-GH reasons. You know, I think it's very important, you know, to make the point that just because you've got genetic hemochromatosis does not mean that everything that goes wrong with your skeleton is due to the GH. You're allowed to have a regular, you know, poor back because you've been lifting heavy stuff. You're allowed to have a regular dodgy shoulder because you've overdone it in the gym. You know, you will get the same common or garden musculoskeletal complaints that non-genetic hemochromatosis patients or people will get. Um, so not all, not, not everything that goes wrong with your skeleton will necessarily be the genetic hemochromatosis. Alison has a question. Um, she wants to know, do, do meds work? She's been prescribed several, which then don't seem to work. And at present, her consultant has put her on rituximab. OK, so the, the pain relieving medications, which I talk, talked about, the three families, they do work for many people, but not always in everybody. But they have a great uh, they, they do have great potential. Rituximab is a monoclonal antibody that inhibits B cells. And that's used for a condition called rheumatoid arthritis. So that would not be a treatment which would be recognised to help hemochromatosis arthritis. So perhaps your consultant thinks you've got rheumatoid and that's why they're giving you um, rituximab. Okay, great. Um, Marianne has a question. Can you remove cyst and osteophytes by surgery without joint replacement? So, so technically you can, but it doesn't make much difference to joint stiffness or to joint pain, so there's no point, because you're no better off afterwards. 
Okay. Um, Anne has um, <laughs> Anne has asked a question. I think it might be a rhetorical question. I'll try and I'll try and repeat it um, word for word. So Anne says, I understand why we often get referred to gastroenterology and orthopedic surgeons for hemochromatosis and joint pain. But why do some of us never get referred to rheumatologists like Dr. Kylie? Gosh, well, that that comes down between you and your and your GP. I mean, the GP will, will refer to orthopedists if they feel that the joint has got to the point that it needs a surgical intervention. The surgeons only get out of bed in the morning to actually operate. So they only want to see you if you're at a point where an operation, the, the, you know, the time has come for an operation. Uh, and the GP may not think that much more can be done before such time comes. Because I hope I've shown you that with using these different three families of pain relief and joint injections, that, that maybe rheumatologists could help you uh, manage your day-to-day -day pain and improve your quality of life up until such time might come when you might then need to have a fusion or a joint replacement. Right, thank you, Patrick. Uh, Christina asks, are you aware of any specific research being undertaken into the iron independent mechanisms of the HFE gene to the joints in the arthropocies you've described? So it'd only be observational work. Um, there's no, no more than that. But before we start getting into research, we've got to get the classification criteria right. We've got to agree what are we calling hemochromatosis arthritis in terms of the pattern recognition. And in, in the exercise which we have spent the last three years going through, we've got three groups of people. We've got people who are C2H2I homozygous with arthritis. That's the sort of, you like the real deal, the, the main common group. And we've got a second group who've got a lesser mutation and arthritis, or they've got the main mutation, but they were never iron overloaded. So um, we're looking at those atypical ones who don't have C2H2I homozygosity and they're never iron overloaded, but they still got arthritis. And we have to look at these in more detail to unravel are they different to the homozygous C2H2Is with arthritis. And once we can work out whether they're different, we can then you know, look into pattern recognition. So we are doing work, but we're at the, the most basic level of understanding what is, are the patterns here. Um, and hopefully we'll, to, we'll be able to give some information about that in about a year. Right. Thank you. Um, Kay's asked quite a lengthy question, which I may paraphrase slightly, but uh, Kay, um, Kay says she was diagnosed homozygous C2A2Y in 2001 by her rheumatologist. There we are. Um, at the age of 54, um, she's had a hip replacement, a knee replacement, and also recently a hind foot osteo oste osteotomy and Halitz Valgus and flat foot correction. Um, her other joints, hand and knee, are especially painful. Um, she wants to know, would you recommend a steroid injection to help her avoid a second knee replacement? So, so a steroid injection can give pain relief for, a, for a, a brief period of time. And if that's acceptable and, and improves your quality of life so you can get about and do what you want to do, then that could be done repeatedly if it works. Um, so it's worth a trial. And if it works and is repeated two or maybe three times a year, that might buy you a few years. Uh, but it won't necessarily stop you ever having to have a knee replacement. It's really a pain relieving mechanism. It's not stopping the progression of arthritis in the joint. The only way to stop the progression of arthritis in the joint is, is through making sure your gait is neutral with orthotics if necessary and trying not to do too much weight bearing on hard surfaces. Keep on grass if you're going for walks. Um, that sort of thing. Strengthen the quadriceps muscle for the knee through cycling. That's that's good to keep the knee stable. Um, and the joint injections are just there really to give you sufficient window of pain relief to keep going for a few more months or years before the inevitability of any replacement may well come and knock on your door. Janice asks a question about pain relief. She says, I use deloxetine for neuropathic pain. Would any triptyline be better? Uh, well, maybe, maybe not. Um, and so we don't mind switching between neuropathic painkillers to the fine one which is best tolerated and, and most effective. So if you feel that deloxetine isn't really that good, then for sure, go back to your doctor, say, could I try pregabalin or could I try amitriptyline? Amitriptyline is best really for nighttime pain or first thing in the morning pain, whereas deloxetine and pregabalin are given twice a day for pain both at night and during the day. But it's not unreasonable to switch and, and try and find the one which suits you best. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Joanne has a has an observation and I think also a question. Uh, Joanne says GPs seem rather ill-informed about hemochromatosis. Uh, I have homozygous C2A2Y 
and yet my mother, sister and both daughters have been told they're too young to have it or their iron levels are fine. In other words, we don't need to do a genetic test. And Joanne asked, Joanne asked the question, is there any training for GPs? Um, so it's rather the same as the, orth as the orthopedic question earlier. GPs, again, do go you know, to do postgraduate um, education. They have to do a certain number of what we call CPD, continuing professional development courses uh, or points a year. But of course, the GP's curriculum is incredibly broad. You know, it's the whole of medicine. And if they're going to light upon a, a module which covers hemochromatosis will depend on their bias and their interests. They might be interested in liver disease. They might be interested in blood disorders. They might go and do some modules on that and come across hemochromatosis that way. So it's such a broad spectrum of illnesses that affect the human body that you are rather hit and miss whether your GP is clued up on this or not. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also worth noting, um, we ourselves have published an e-learning module for GPs, um, which has been live now for about a year, and we're seeing lots and lots of GPs going through that. So uh, if you have a GP or you have someone in your family who might benefit from a GP doing some e-learning, um, you can go to our website and you can direct them uh, there, yeah. um, and, and they can earn two CPD points, which, as Patrick was saying, is quite important to maintaining their professional registration. Um, we're almost out of time. Um, I, I, there seem to be quite a few questions on two topics, so I just want to broadly paraphrase and summarise these. Um, one question, uh, Patrick, is for those people um, uh, listening who are very engaged with this, we've seen a few people saying, how do we get involved in one of your trials? Is there a, is there a mechanism for people to get involved? That's right. well, very, very generous of you to, to offer, and thank you very much. At the moment, we've stopped recruiting for the classification criteria project because we've had lots of help, and thank you, thank you again for that. Um, so at the moment, there's nothing open, so to speak, for recruitment. But if there was something, we'd almost certainly involve the society, and I'm sure that Neil would be happy to say this is now a, a possible trial for people to... Um, volunteer for and you would see it through the society yeah we absolutely we're very supportive of the work that patrick and colleagues are doing and uh, whenever there's an opportunity for people to get involved in research we proactively promote that we think it's a good thing yeah, um, the other you. question the, the, the other question is is um, perhaps a little bit close to home as well which is a number of people are saying how do we get referred to dr kylie is there a way <laughs> right. that people can can be directed to your clinic without uh, treading on the wrong toes? No, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you have to go to your GP and say, look, I've got this rare disease and, I, and it's got an arthritis, which is a bit weird and a bit different. And, you know, there is a doctor in, in southwest London, in St. George's, who, who runs a hemochromatosis arthritis clinic. And he's happy to see people from across the country you know, and, and would you be prepared to let me go? And some GPs will be sympathetic and some will say, well, you've got our own local rheumatologist. You've got to go and see your local rheumatologist first and see if they can't help you first. You know, and that's fine because there are some fantastic rheumatologists up and down the country who may well be able to inject your joints for you and try diff these different families of painkillers. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not the only rheumatologist that can do all that. There's many, many who can. Uh, but if you have seen a rheumatologist and you haven't really been knocking on an open door and you haven't really got what you want to get, then you know go back to your gp say look i'd love to have a second opinion they are allowed patients are allowed to ask for second opinions and then it's down to whether the gp is prepared to make the referral and it's on an alternative monday afternoon at st george's in two things you've got all morning to get to london you've got the weekend before to go and do something else as many patients do and make a make a trip of it and i you know and i'm there in the afternoon and you've got time to get home mm. um and i'm happy to talk to you about your your story about your version of arthritis and but, but the management principles that, you know, I've been through in this talk, so that that's all I've got up my sleeve is three types of painkillers, joint injections, and nag you to go and see a podiatrist, which you don't need to come and see me to go and see a podiatrist. Mm, fantastic. And, and I think, you know, judging from the interest at the British Society of Rheumatology Conference earlier this year, there's actually a really large number of rheumatologists who are actually starting to get switched on to genetic hemochromatosis. I think perhaps Patrick, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, was a bit plowing a, a lone furrow, if I can put it like that. But thanks to the work that uh, Patrick has been doing, it's much, much more widely recognised, um, these particular distinctive patterns of joint arthropathy. And uh, I have to say, I was very encouraged when I was at the conference in Manchester, just how many rheumatologists were proactively looking at cases, again, to actually try and work out whether this strange 
pattern of um, you know a joint arthropathy was actually hematosis and certainly two or three years ago I don't think we would very often hear a rheumatologist referring someone for a genetic test uh, yeah. but at the conference this year there were many people who came to our stand and said oh yes they're they're now proactively doing that in cases where it's it's unclear as to why they've got that kind of presentation so I think it's very much uh, an improving situation I think we do have to thank Patrick for his diligence and his care about this condition because Actually, I think 20 years ago, there was there was very little interest professionally in this condition, wasn't there? In the That's correct. Community. Yeah. Um, we are now, um, sadly, at time. So um, I'm sorry for those of you who have asked a question and I haven't had an opportunity to get round to you. What we will do after this session is we'll try and summarise those questions. And if there are things where we think we might be able to help you, uh, one of our helpline team will be in touch with you directly. OK, so if you've, if you've still got a burning question, uh, we will reach out to you. Um, but we have now reached time with Patrick. And so I just want to say thank you again, uh, Patrick, for all of the work that you're doing for our community. It's a 365 day of the year commitment to people with hemochromatosis, which is tremendous. And also to thank you again for such an illuminating and very fascinating presentation and some very cogent answers to questions which you hadn't seen before. So you've done very well. No, no, no. no it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's, I'm always happy to try and help if I possibly can. Thank you very much. And with that, we will now close the webinar and wish everyone a good afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye now. Bye bye.